Hey guys, welcome in. Uh, we're just going to spend about five or oh, a couple of minutes waiting for, for, for everyone to jump in so we can get started. And I'll introduce everyone uh, and make sure everyone understands how to use all the different functions on, on, on the webinar. We can get started. Jace, Ryan, Harry, how are you? Good, thanks. Very Ryan, well. How are you? I'm good, thank you. We have to do this bit at the beginning, and I'll say this on every webinar where we pretend that we haven't been speaking for five or so minutes before yeah. this. Uh, just yeah, so fancy good. seeing you guys here. What a, what a, what a question. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. We're all here at the same time. It's almost like this was all. <laughs> just going to give it uh, a couple more minutes, guys, just to let, let people filter in. Lewis, did you paint the painting on Ryan's wall? I wish I did. It's very, it, it's very kind of minimalist and uh, looks like it's been done by a professional. No, my uh, my paintings aren't quite that, uh, quite that, aren't quite that astute. Realised there was a, a big painting of you, a self-portrait. Yeah, I that. I wasn't. Yeah, going to... I'm glad we've pointed it out to everyone. Are you so wearing can... the same T-shirt. It's a very similar t-shirt, yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> this goes well. I'll try and recreate it so there's two of me. Lewis after the last webinar. <laughs> uh, welcome in, guys. If you've got any questions that you want to ask, um, there is a Q&A function. Uh, you can obviously use the chat function within here. If you've got a question that you would like to be answered, please do try and put it in the Q&A section. Um, and I will go through those at the end. Uh, yeah, feel free to chat amongst yourselves and, and, and put stuff in the chat box, but it's easier to see stuff in the Q&A. So if we, can, uh, if we can add stuff in there as and when, that would be great. Uh, I'm just going to give it a couple more minutes and then we will get started. Welcome in, guys. Welcome in. Just for those of you who just got in here, uh, there is a chat function that you can use to, to chat amongst yourselves, but also feel free to add questions to the Q&A. Um, I'll be monitoring that throughout, uh, and we'll uh, try and answer any questions that, that do come in uh, at the end of the session. Just going to get the screen share ready for you guys so we can go through the presentation. Hopefully everyone can see that. Yeah, I can see it at least. Yeah. Good. That's the main thing. Yeah, that's <laughs> the main thing you guys can see. All right. What time are we on? 12.04. One more minute and we'll get started. See where we are. Okie dokie, I think we'll get moving. We should see a couple more people filtering in as, as we go through. Uh, as I said, if you didn't hear, if you've got a question, please pop it in the, in the Q&A function on here, uh, and we'll answer those at the end. Uh, before we get into presenting and sharing should we introduce ourselves harry go for it hello i am harry willis i'm the partnerships lead at uh at rello and i handle the agency partnership side so talking a lot with with agencies like you guys um and also on the tech partner side um so i'm um, yeah dealing with both of those programs currently and then helping all of our subscription merchants as well perfect uh ryan you want to introduce Hi. yourself yeah thank you i'm ryan forster i look after partnerships uh here across kind of european region at, at recharge payments and yeah thanks for inviting me on today really excited to have this conversation uh hopefully everyone here has heard of recharge who's on this call uh if not with a kind of leading subscription 
building platform and um, yeah, we'll be jumping into some, some good conversations around subscriptions and how to optimize that today. So thanks for the invite as well, guys. Great. No, lovely to have you here. And of course, Jason Stokes, please introduce thanks. yourself. Uh, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Jason Stokes. I'm the founder and CEO of Isoco. Um, yeah. Looking forward to talking through all things subscriptions with you. Great. And I am uh, Lewis. Uh, I'm the CMO here at Eastside. Uh, I will be mainly just hosting today and, and allowing these fine people to, to give all of their wonderful insights. Uh, we've got a couple more people that have just dropped in. Uh, I'll say this for, for one last time. If you've got anything to ask or questions as we go through the presentation, please do put them in the Q&A section uh, and that allows me to just keep track of them and make sure we're answering everything we can. Lovely to have you all here. We will get started with the presentation. Uh, where are we? Here we go. What's happening here? What's happening? Sorry, this is my technical. <laughs> Always the way. Once the recording Always starts, the way. everything Always. fails. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Hopefully, that's the presentation now. There we go. Great. Right, so, today's, <laughs> uh, we're all good to go, I think. So, today's webinar is going to be seven tips on generating a seven figure subscription business. We could have gone with eight tips for an eight figure, nine tips for a nine figure but seven rolls off the tongue quite nicely. So let's go with that. Uh, so just a little bit about who we are, Isaiko. Um, we're, we're obsessed with all things Shopify, really. Uh, we have built an agency that is designed to cover everything that's e-commerce, and we're really hyper-focused on Shopify as a platform. Uh, we love the platform, uh, and we have built lots and lots of stools uh, for lots and lots of different clients across all kinds of different industries, uh, just a few of which you can see here. Um, as I said, I'm Lewis. I'm going to be hosting today, uh, CMO here at Isaiko. We've got Jason Stokes, who's uh, the CEO and founder of Isaiko. Ryan, who's the partner manager at Recharge, and Harry, who is the partnerships lead at Rello. So welcome to all of you guys. Very pleased to have you here. Um, so subscriptions in general have been booming i remember way back when and it was only the likes of i don't know like grays that were, were doing this kind of subscription but now it seems to be that there's huge amounts of subscription brands uh, popping up all over the place and subscription commerce is expected to grow 70 percent year on year and to hit 500 billion billion with a b there uh by 2025 so i'm just curious from from before we kind of get into the tips i'm curious from from you guys as to as to why you think subscriptions have become such a a major part of the e-commerce ecosystem and why you think it's grown so quickly um i mean harry it'd be great to start with you what, what are your thoughts on subscription in general and, and what's happening in that space yeah absolutely uh i think that generally like especially at the moment i think that there's a lot of uncertainty in the market there's all this talks about recession there's always talks about um about customers maybe wanting to spend less over time um, mm -hmm. and for brands being able to offer a subscription and get people onto that uh, monthly recurring revenue instead of it being kind of month by month variable revenue as you would have with just purchasing one-off products again and again is super super appealing so I think that also has a flip side effect where a lot of marketing resources are just going into marketing subscriptions generally because they have that impact on on lifetime value that all these kind of merchants are looking towards to to make more resilient businesses basically um so, so yeah i'd say that's why why the general focus is flipping so much to it and that why that forecast looks uh yeah pretty spot on although it is also gigantic as well <laughs> it is it is and ryan you must be you must be happy to hear about this forecast <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course i mean reach out has been uh in, in subscriptions that we reach out started in 2014 so <clears throat> we've been in the industry when it was uh, a much smaller market and we've seen kind of growth doubling uh, kind of year on year uh, the figure was valued at around 20 billion in, in 2020 so that that 70 percent growth is getting you to that to that 500 billion by 2025 which isn't too far away um i really think that it goes in line with the whole growth of the, the birth of d2c brands so 
businesses that that come to market with a great brand, a great product that has a focus on quality, a focus a focus on their on their values, their ethics as a company, which is something that we weren't able to find on the, the high street. You know, the typical high street didn't offer us that um, the the variance um, and you know ability to shop for these great products that um, that that D 2 C does. So I think that whole growth of D 2 C, particularly on Shopify. I guess the rising tide somewhat um, allows us to, to to see that subscription market really grow alongside um, DTC generally. And for the majority of businesses that are offering consumable products, um, for those kind of businesses across beauty and personal care, food and beverage, health and supplement, pets. So these kind of core verticals of, of DTC lend themselves really well to subscription. So if you're buying things on a regular period, it kind of it was inevitable. It's very logical to start offering subscriptions. So that's where um, it, where we've seen the growth, and um, it it shows no signs of slowing down, um, with, without a doubt. And we've seen that over the kind of pandemic period, that definitely added some velocity. Mm -hmm. Also seen as we kind of had to readjust coming out of that period. Actually, those habits have been instilled in people, and we haven't. We were we were you know everyone was kind of waiting to see if there would be what the readjustment would be and how big that readjustment might might affect um the, the subscription side of businesses but that's actually remained pretty stable throughout so um i think that businesses or, or consumers more to the point like to find those businesses uh, once they find a great product and a great brand that they actually they believe in that, that they believe in their ethics and their values or they just really like the product whatever it may be then they tend to stick around for, for a long time and, and having that convenience element to it where it can just be dropped off to your door each week each month mm -hmm. Um, makes it seamless amazing so i mean i think one of the things and, and, and jc may be able to talk a, a little bit around this is you know historically the, the barrier to ent entry in terms of creating a subscription brand was quite high if you go back you know even five ten years the, the, the cost of the technology do you think jason that the, the platforms like shopify and, and Rello and recharge have, have enabled more you know smaller merchants to, to get into the game a little bit with subscriptions do you think that's part of the reason that we've seen such growth they've definitely made it much more accessible uh much more accessible to brands that are um kind of on a disruptive journey but at the start of a disruptive journey mm -hmm. um you know to touch upon kind of something harry and, and ryan said as well you know we see things we, we sit from kind of two sides one of them is you know the customer centric approach wanting to provide simplicity uh, and efficiency uh, when it comes to reordering of your products for you know for customers that want to engage with you in that way you know they don't have to think about going to reorder every two weeks four weeks six weeks two months uh, they can you know put themselves at the heart of the journey uh, and pick the frequency that they would like to receive the products in and the other side of that from a commercial point of view is the kind of uh, as as harry mentioned the forecast ability you know when you've got a run rate when you've got a retained kind of customer base it's much easier to be much more aggressive on your customer acquisition as well if you know your lifetime value of a customer is y uh, and your cpa is x you can be much more aggressive you don't necessarily need to make money on the first purchase it may be on the second and the third because you know uh, there'll be a subscriber for the next two years uh, and what your churn rates are so it's all about the metrics it's all about the data really that supports the marketing department's ability uh, to be a bit more aggressive with the customer acquisition. Great. All right, so now we know that the, the market has grown and lots of people are, are, are joining in the kind of uh, subscription model. Uh, let's hit some of the, the, the tips that we've pulled together uh, that will, will hopefully help um, existing and, and new merchants to, to grow their, their subscription business. So tip number one, choose the right subscription model. So we've got, we've got three subscription models that we kind of outlined here. So curation, replenishment, uh, and access. So on the creation side, curation side, this is more the kind of subscription box where you, you see this with, um, I've subscribed to a few of these um, uh, where they send you out, you know, different different products on a monthly basis. You've got replenishment, which is the consumable side. I, I think that was uh, mentioned by you there, Ryan, about, you know, vitamin brands or anything consumable that you're going to need regular replenishment off. And then the access, which allows members access to different perks and different discounts. So we've seen some of these are kind of more true to a standard subscription model, model like the curation and replenishment. Some of these are, um, you know, the membership model that we're seeing a few fashion brands go down uh, in terms of uh, deliveries and that kind of thing. Um, uh, Harry, 
are you seeing any particular trends in where people are going in terms of these subscription models are you are you seeing anything uh any any particular focus for brands at the moment uh i think from our side definitely on the on the replenishment side mm -hmm. because the the relo product product and i realize I, I didn't give much of a summary at the beginning but we're a repeat revenue platform for d2c mm -hmm. brands so although we work with subscriptions at that kind of end of the funnel we also have uh an entire tool set around basically driving one-time customers onto a repeat purchase. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think, yeah, this this that middle section is kind of interesting because it's like, if you're fostering repeat purchases from people, it's the perfect feeder into your subscription because very often people aren't gonna be jumping from a one-time purchase just straight onto a subscription. You need to kind of nurture them. And so that's kind of where we really focus in terms of a product. Um, on the curation side, yeah, we can, we can do some, um, some subscription management and things that I guess we'll, we'll touch on a bit later. Um, but in terms of the kind of headlines that we're reading, yeah, the, the access side is super interesting. And I think that really relates back to your, your previous side about like, where is this huge growth coming from and mm -hmm. what's fueling it? I think it's also the diversification of the types of subscriptions that are coming. Um, I think the membership model is, if we're gonna look at one of these uh, as a kind of high growth area across the next couple of years, the membership side is gonna be big, I think. Uh, and what about you, Ryan? Are you seeing a are you seeing a similar trend with the with the membership model side of things? Is that is that an area that you're seeing grow, uh, or are you still seeing the core of the business being around the kind of replenishment and curation side? Yeah, absolutely. So um, curation and, and replenishment. That's really, I guess, curation is really the birth of subscriptions. So that that, that was the kind of first original kind of subscription model. Mm -hmm. um, these are boxes that are filled with various products, depending on what vertical you're in. So really, it's the, the merchant gets the choice of what product they put into the box each month, for example. And the value proposition was really like the kind of, it became more popular during lockdown as well, which was that kind of unboxing. So that's kind of surprise element actually lends itself pretty well to gifting as well. Mm -hmm. So that curated box of, of products was something that kind of really started to boom within subscriptions. And then replenishment um, was again, a kind of was the, the next kind of obvious choice for those, those consumable goods where I have, you know, beauty and personal care, um, pet food, et cetera, as we've already mentioned there such an obvious kind of replenishment. I want to, I want this on an, on a monthly, on a, a bi-monthly uh, replenishment mm -hmm. schedule. And that's typically where we see the subscribe and save model. So if you're going to buy this product, we know you're going to buy it on a frequency of 30 days. If you subscribe to it, we'll give you 5% off, for example. And mm -hmm. that's really all around physical products. So physical products have been the kind of the bread and butter, the core of subscriptions for a long time from a, from a shop buy and from a recharge perspective. And then, uh, you know, that has created a business of, on recharge of, you know, nearly 20,000 merchants, all pretty much doing curation and, and replenishment, 50 million mm -hmm. subscribers using that platform. And then some of the most requested uh, features and kind of accessibility to the product has over the last couple of years and the growth set that we're seeing is membership. So those, those businesses that have products that lend themselves well to a curated box or to a replenishable monthly month by month product. Of course, they're just gonna go down those routes. But if I'm a business that um, has uh, a really loyal customer base already, I have, you know, I have good revenues from my customer base, but my product is maybe a, a luxury fashion house or it's like a, you know, a jean company, for example, I'm not gonna sell my jeans, um, obviously on a monthly subscription, but how do I kind of create that um, firstly recurring revenue for my business? I want that stability. I want that recurring revenue. And I want to be able to grow my revenues through subscriptions. Then access is that is that kind of silver bullet to a degree. Um, just being Amazon Prime model, um, where mm -hmm. I'm not getting access to a physical product on subscription. I'm paying a monthly fee, but that's getting me access to to services and perks as a as a VIP as a member for for this Gene brand. And and as a and as a merchant, I might offer something along the lines of free next day delivery. It might be access or uh, early access to products. It might be discount ranges across either the store or certain ranges of products, even like limited products, exclusive products to my to members, and even content, gated content areas, whether that's on the store or in the customer portal, just for my members to really kind of create that um, that demand uh, with that, that existing customer base and start to build out a recurring revenue model um, via that access. So access is definitely the next uh, uh kind of thing in subscriptions whereas you, curation replenishment has been has been subscriptions to date that is that is pretty much what subscriptions is based on right 
I can see you, you're taking up everyone else's points and everyone's ticking them off their list as they go through going, oh, Ryan's already said that one, damn it. <laughs> um, but I am going to lead on to, to Jason here. I mean, if you are starting a, uh, I know you've had, you've had some kind of experience uh, in the past, Jason, with your own DTC brands with, um, if not subscription directly, certainly, you know, consumable products. Mm -hmm. When you're going through this process of either, you, you know, thinking about starting a business, how do you go about, in your head how do you go about assessing what the what the right subscription model is for you um when you when you're thinking about a business i, mean, I guess it start it, it ultimately starts with what type of business you are mm -hmm. um you know we worked with brands across e each of these areas um you know similarly to, to you know to ryan and, and harry really you know and i'm uh, a customer of a lot of different models of these I, you know ryan mentioned prime is probably one of the most uh, popular and, and notable examples of an, an access type membership solution that enables you to have the perk side of things, the gated content side of things. You know, I, I was going to mention educational based businesses that we've supported with, you know, membership um, based solutions where you can subscribe to content, learn about a different, um, uh, different topic, um, you know, fast moving consumer goods with the replenishment side of things. Uh, you know, consumables really, and, and then the curation side of things, there's a lot of different, not necessarily mill subscriptions, but, um, you know, I can remember a spice or a, 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 a type meal type kit that I used to subscribe to, uh, and a fashion business as well. Uh, you know, a company that used to do curated boxes on a monthly basis based on the brands that you liked. Um, you necessarily wouldn't know what's in there. They would pick the, the, the items that they thought you would like, uh, and you'd have that turn up and have the ability to be able to return the items that you didn't want. Um, so the, the starting point for this is, you know, what type of business are you? What type of products are you going to be selling? Um, and it may be a hybrid of a few different things that would be right for you. Um, you also may be an existing business that wants to uh, evolve into offering a membership or kind of some type of curation or, or replenishment subscription type service. Um, so looking at examples in the marketplace, seeing whether there's anybody out there that, you know, any challenger brands that are out there kind of disrupting your industry, um, or seeing whether there's anything that you can adopt from a similar base business model uh, that would kind of port quite nicely over to what to what you're doing. There's a good point there as well, Jason, because these aren't these aren't exclusive. These are, it may be that you have you start out with your your first entry into subscriptions might be a replenishment product, then you move on to offering a more complex product with a curated product. And like you say, as you evolve as a business, you might actually want to start looking at how you can build a membership product as well. So these aren't um, mutually exclusive by any means. These can be uh, yeah hybrid, and these can be a, these are definitely like a foundation, a starting point at very least. But without a doubt, you'll be iterating your subscription offering as you evolve and grow as a business. Awesome. I mean, so it seems to me uh, that, you know, curation is, is, is really great. Maybe if you're not, uh, you're not uh, narrowed down to a specific product, but maybe you're, you're in a, you know, you are in a specific vertical. So I've seen supermarkets do this kind of thing where they can kind of, um, send you different products or, or maybe you have a content brand that is, is talking around a specific subject so you already have an audience and curation is a great way to monetize that without necessarily having to 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 create and build a specific product line replenishment works really well for, for anything that's consumable really or, or something that you're going to need on a regular basis you have your own product line you know people are going to be buying it on a on a regular basis and then access i think like you say historically it was almost like access to services or content um, but now it's it's also access to perks like i said fashion brands using it for free delivery across the year or or um you know access to vip discounts all that kind of stuff stuff and, and like you say you can mix and match this uh to, to to whatever kind of suits you really okay cool let's move on to the second tip so th i think this has become much more important in, in recent years but giving subscribers flexibility um you know i think historically subscription brands were very much you know the subscribe and save you know if you subscribe to this you get 10 percent off and that was that was really the, the 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 whole thing but now i think subscribers are demanded much more flexibility around frequency around um what products they get in their subscription there's a whole host of things that that, that certainly merchants are coming to us to ask for so Jason, when, when we're talking about giving subscribers flexibility, 
Um, what what do you think that means to merchants? Like how what what kind of things should they be considering in terms of the flexibility that they give to their customers? I think it probably starts from the frequency, so the flexibility around how regularly uh, or from the offset you'll you'll you know you'll you'll be able to subscribe and what types of products you'll be able to subscribe to as well. You know, is it just one or can you subscribe to a range of products to be delivered at a range of different frequencies potentially? Mm -hmm. So without wanting to overcomplicate things on the front end, have a think about how you can put the merchant's experience at the heart of the journey without overcomplicating your back office. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes simplicity is key, you know, creating bundles or, or packages that people can subscribe to rather than kind of lots of different disparate products it tends to work quite well. Um, and then on the back end, um, creating experience that enables the merchant to pause subscriptions if they're going on holiday. Um, or if they're out of the country on work for a month, for instance, you know, giving them the ability to change the frequency, whether they're not getting enough product quick enough, you know, ultimately sell them more, uh, or to be able to add products to their subscription as well, or extend the frequency based on, you know, okay, I'm getting this once every two weeks, I'm not using it, I don't want to cancel it, but I can't keep having these received because I've got, um, you know, a large uh, a large amount of them now turning up that I'm not getting through. Um, so again, putting the putting the heart the, the, the customer at the heart of the journey, enabling them to be able to personalize their subscription, which is something Recharge does beautifully well. Um, and it's a nice segue, I guess, into Ryan and uh, what his thoughts are on this. <laughs> I mean, you know, what I was going to ask uh, Ryan and, and Harry really is, mm. I'm, I'm interested to see what you know in terms of your roadmap of product development. What what are, what are the demands that are being made from merchants in terms of we really need to see this because our customers want X, Y, and Z. Are you seeing any trends in in around kind of subscriber flexibility that 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 kind of would be impactful? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there, and Harry, I'll I'll, I'll uh, take it take the floor after there, just because. Um, yeah, obviously with with the like Jason mentioned there on the on the storefront, being as flexible as you can, offer different as many options as you can, but customer first equal, equally there's a lot of value in keeping things simple to start with and then you can start to iterate on that as you as you build out the program uh, from a subscription perspective but yeah post sale obviously customer portal areas the ability to manage subscriptions is a really key piece of not just um, giving customers flexibility but it's actually how you start to in, increase the LTV of those customers it's how you increase average order value it's how you increase retention excuse me and it's how you reduce churn so the our our portal options that are kind of standard that out of the box that you you get a standard on recharge have been consistently upgraded and, and optimized over the years um, you can imagine what the product looked like from 2014 to where it is now in, in 2022 there's been a lot of evolution there and that's really a mix of merchants pushing us on what we need to provide out of the box and also from the consumers that dictate that to to the merchants equally where we've all been in a subscription program at very basic level we've all been in a subscription program for and you go to get it's great through when you go through the purchase flow it feels like a great product a great service everything's shiny and then when you get to post sale you try to cancel out for whatever legitimate reason and you can't that is a real frustration um so starting with the basics to make sure that you don't block people from from managing their subscription even at you know very worse having to cancel the subscription is still a good thing to offer that flexibility but conversely from cancelling it's really an opportunity in that portal to increase ltv like i said so that just offering that flexibility to skip this month's delivery like i have too much product or like jay said i'm going on holiday i just don't need this month's delivery just skip it with one click of a button I've got uh, a product that I've been subscribed to for a while now on replenishment. I'm getting a bit bored of the, the the shower gel scent, for example. I just want to swap that product out really simply, um, you know, and just be able to like also manage the frequency, no problems. And also within that customer portal, you also, you also need the ability to be able to increase average order values as well. So there's a way to upsell and cross sell in these customer portals. Um, that being the portal uh, is obviously it's on your desktop, it's on on your store. Is also optimized for mobile, but there are other kind of integrations that you can extend further on from a flexibility perspective with the likes of email. And I'm, I'm leaving <laughs> nicely here, Harry, into SMS capabilities as well around who can offer that greater flexibility than just a customer portal. Yeah, definitely. I think there's like there's two sides to this this flexibility piece. I think you have the the ability to make those changes you just mentioned, Ryan, the skip, the pause, the, the delay, those are almost becoming kind of table stakes for subscription brands now. But I think there's a 
massive importance on the other side of just making sure people know about that flexibility at the right time. Because there's one thing about having all this functionality in the portal, but like if people aren't being prompted at exactly the right moment in the customer journey to actually go in there and being empowered to make changes to their subscription, very often the default is just, I'm gonna send an email and cancel, which is a obviously worst case scenario when you've spent all those resources in getting customers all the way up to a paid subscription. Um, so triggering emails and triggering uh, SMS at exactly the right time to go out at that moment when people might need to change or they're considering making a change is, uh, is really high impact because it gets people making um, empowered changes to their subscription and it means that their default is just not to cancel um so yeah what we typically do at, at Rello is we trigger a, an email or an sms which can go out either through natively through recharge or it can trigger natively through um through clavio and it basically just means that it says hey here's your subscription it's set to renew in three days um click here if you want to make any changes and yeah what we find is just by by getting that traffic into that kind of um moment it means that people are just empowered to make changes and they don't cancel um and the flip side to it is we've developed a kind of um what you might look at as a kind of no login portal which takes a lot of actions that can be done in the portal but it just means that no login is necessarily required so it just means that we can kind of remove an additional friction point which might otherwise lead to to people um yeah diverting and taking a kind of path that you don't want them to i think that there is there is nothing worse than subscribing to something and then going on to cancel and receiving a message that says, please phone this number. It, I just cannot, <laughs> I don't know whether this is just me uh, not having to have spoken to too many people outside of, outside of work and family for like two years, but I just don't want to have to go through that process. And actually that, I think historically with subscription or certainly when it first started, it was very much a case of if we get people in through the door, Maybe they'll forget. They, you know, we'll get at least one of the purchase out of them. But the the, the kind of anti-intuitive thing of saying to people, just as a subscription is about to renew, hey, this is going to happen. Just making sure you don't forget about it actually retains more customers than it loses. And at least if they do cancel, I mean, they're more likely to pause or or delay, etc. In that case, but if at least if they do cancel, you can understand where that customer is in the process and why they've cancelled and, and start to communicate with them in a, in a different way. I think we always talk around, you know, there's three core reasons why people cancel their subscription. The first one is they didn't like the products. That's a, that's a difficult one to get around, um, but there's maybe some good feedback to be got there from your customers. The second one is that they've got too much of the product, which, which, which either goes around frequency or um, how much they're using it. Again, this can be solved through the flexibility in the customer portal um, or with some content generation about making sure you know with consumables like vitamins for example making sure that they are remembering to use it every day mm -hmm. uh, and and the third one is cost and again that's something that is uh you know if you have the flexibility to say if people are going to cancel rather than pause or delay that you can then start to incentivize them to stay on for a little bit longer with with discounts or, or rewards for for ongoing loyalty i suppose uh so next tip Oh, wow. It's like I knew what the next slide was talking about loyalty there. So providing perks uh, to loyal customers. Um, we're seeing a lot of loyalty programs kind of uh, pop up now and, and lots of great tech partners with, with loyalty programs. Um, and it's certainly going beyond just the simple points for prizes stuff now. Um, in terms of subscription and loyalty, you know, what, what, what are some kind of good integrations or good use cases that, that you guys have seen around that? Harry, I'll start with you this time. I think Loyalty Lion are a great, a great partner of, of both ours and, and of Recharge. And I mm -hmm. think, um, yeah, building ongoing points that can be redeemed on other things, which might also lead into more products that lead into more bundling into your subscription and a greater um, outcome on the LTV is a, uh, is a no brainer, I think. And it's a super, super um, high impact partner that you can pull in there. Um, so that would be my my main go to on the on the loyalty side, I think. Perfect. And uh, Ryan, what 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 kind of I'm seeing some some slight differences in, in how loyalty loyalty programs are run these days. And certainly with sustainable companies that it's not just about necessarily redeeming your points for discounts We're seeing people redeem your points to plant a tree um you know there's there's further you can go with that 
is there anything that you've seen out there that you think um, is a really good example of of loyalty programs and how they've been integrated integrated with with um, with subscription programs or any recommendations that you've got on on, on loyalty programs in, in relation to subscription generally? Yeah, that's great. And um, yeah, loyalty is obviously a kind. They go they're almost symbiotic. They they work they go hand in hand with each other from a subscription. Um, obviously, that generates the kind of recurring revenue for the merchant, which is great, and it's the convenience for the end user. Loyalty is that exactly that. It's an additional perk to kind of really help to really help kind of incentivize and, and not just incentivize, but really reward your most loyal customers, obviously. And so that's where we've seen such a um, you know, LTV seems such a crucial part of any DTC's business. The more you can do to really help retain that business uh, and make sure your customers are happy is a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. um, there are multiple integrations that recharge work with. And like you said, there are um there's some really great examples of how incentivization i, I do have I, I i subscribe to a number of, of brands myself as you'd probably imagine working for a subscription mm -hmm. company um like with uh in the uk there's a great uh, curated box called craft gin club uh it's it's a gin box each month mm -hmm. you get a delivery of gin and uh, complimentary products around it which is a great product which i love but actually in their portal they built in directly into the customer portal they've actually got integration um where they have their loyalty points kind of stacked up and they show you these different levels. Um, so you have like a bronze, silver, gold membership as you, you purchase more, um, you, you accrue more points and you're actually able to, uh, you're actually able to redeem those points directly in the customer portal, for example. So mm -hmm. making that really easy, making it really accessible and kind of obvious to, to customers is a great point. And um, ultimately this is here to, to increase lifetime value and it, and it works perfectly well. I think that's a good point there with the, you know, I think with with loyalty programs, with referral schemes, there is often a, a weird disconnect between the custom portal and, and the loyalty program. They're almost two separate things working yeah. in a silo. I mean, Jason, from your perspective, uh, I mean, firstly, have you, you know, have you seen, uh, you know, loyalty programs out there that, that you think are worth shouting about and, and how they're integrated into subscriptions? And, and secondly, how, how important do you think it is to to kind of make sure those things are, are fully integrated into each other and um, not not kind of built in silos. Yeah, so I guess kind of thinking about the front end of the experience of the customer, you know, if your preference as a brand is to try and entice customers to subscribe versus to take a single time product, uh, you could in offer increased loyalty points. I know it's a kind of you know a, a bit of a psychological kind of you know tack to try and get them to choose that model but you know subscribe and earn double the amount of loyalty points um mm -hmm. so you can use you know you use tactics like that on the front end to entice subscription from a reward perspective um but then the customers are you know on a monthly basis accruing points you know every month without having to actually go and do something they are having their points kind of increase so having an email on a monthly basis saying well you've now got this amount of points uh, that turns up like clockwork and that says, right, okay, you know, you'll touch these gifts or redeem it by doing this. It's communicating nice news. It's communicating, you know, something positive to the to the, to the customer, the merchant, uh, on a regular basis, enabling them to be able to trade them in for either additional products, additional rewards. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, you can have different levels of of reward based kind of tiered systems as well. You know, this is a VIP kind of customer. They, they spend this much, they've got this amount of points. Um, that may get them access to, you know, uh, free delivery or free memberships or something uh, along those lines as well. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah. Uh, I, I think I think one of the interesting things is, you know, talking about your, you know, your top tier customers or, or your um, loyal customers, if you've got them segmented out, is we, we, we often talk about how we kind of migrate people from just being loyal customers into actual advocates of the brand. And I think one of the interesting ways that, that, you know, a loyalty program can work is by offering people experiences rather than just extra products, right? Actually giving value back. So if you're a fashion brand, and you've got a hundred customers that are your top spending customer, inviting them to the launch of your next, um, your next, you know, your fall edition or whatever that might be. Um, clearly, I'm not a fashion guy. That's obvious from what I've just said. But you know, giving them experiences and memories and and trying to convert them from just customers into advocates is another interesting way that that uh, you know a loyalty a loyalty program can be 
can be implemented. I think um, Wild actually do this really well, Wild Deodorant, where they, they take their customers and they get feedback on what's the next scent we should produce. And they produce great campaigns around that and actually get feedback from their customers um, that are purchasing from them regularly. Um, so user experience is something we kind of, certainly in agencies, we band around quite a lot. Um, so we're saying focus on user experience here. Jay, so can you kind of bring that to its essence, talk about, you know, what do we mean when we say focus on, on user experience, from, from, certainly from a subscription perspective? Uh, so <laughs> in essence, it's getting the customer to the end journey as quickly as possible, providing them all the information that they would need along that route. Um, again, it, it starts with the product and the buyer personas, you know, understanding what your customer expectations would be, understanding what steps you would need to go through the, for those customers to be educated, to be informed, to be able to make decisions, to be empowered uh, in order to, you know, to subscribe as in, in as few steps as possible. Wild is probably a good example of an onboarding flow that we've created. Uh, again, this goes to kind of the type of business you are. You know, we work with dog food subscription companies, we work with coffee subscription businesses, uh, where they'll kind of take people through a quiz and, you know, almost ask them, uh, you know, what dog have you got? What weight is it? Um, you know, is it male or female? Get the relevant information to be able to then have a recommendation engine uh, at the end of that that offers the bundle or package that may be suitable for the dog that you've got. Food subscriptions can do slightly similar things when it comes to the different types of food you like. You know, are you allergic to anything? You know, are you vegetarian? Um, so it really does depend on, you know, the, the product you're going to be kind of, you know, selling ultimately in the package that you've created. Um, it, but it could be as simple as uh, a subscribe and save. You know, this product is a one-time purchase. This is an as, as addition to the product, the, the PDP page the product page um and it's how you elevate that uh throughout the you know throughout the hierarchy of the page to make sure that that surfaced mm -hmm. as a you know really viable option or the preferred option if that was the case okay just to jump in on the on the quiz side of that as well um and just really understanding exactly what subscription you need to move the customer onto that can have a marked impact in terms of your subscription churn uh, because typically, like just as you mentioned, Lewis, like one of the biggest drivers of subscription churn is stockpiling. People get too much product because they've picked the wrong size or the frequency. If you can focus on user experience at the start and make sure that they're guiding themselves through a very neatly organized quiz so that you can understand that on a really granular level means you can match them onto the perfect subscription, which in turn means the lifetime value of that subscriber is just gonna be much higher generally. Yeah, I think I think I think especially when, you know, I think one of the challenges, you know, if you talk about coffee subscription, for example, is there's so many different varieties of coffee. You've got to consider whether they want whole beans or ground or pods. You know, so there's quite a lot of complexity around there. And I think if you try and, you know, create individual product pages for all of those things, then customers will jump around a lot and then be distracted or become um, you know, become bored of that process or they're just clicking through inertia, they're just going through the process. Whereas if you can contain that information in, in as tight a package as possible, it makes it really, really simple. So, you know, um, coffee companies for a long time now have been doing quizzes where it's you go through and you answer a series of questions and at the end it says, this is this is what we recommend for a, from a subscription and a frequency uh, perspective. So the customer's not having to, to figure that out on the fly. Uh, and Wild, again, is, is a really good example. You can see as this is going through some of the screenshots here, they're doing uh, everything from guiding the customers through. When you're looking at what scent you want, it's it's got the kind of information contained in there. Um, it, it gives you clear indication of why subscribe and save is a good thing. You know, all of that information is within uh, a contained space. So it's not like when it gets to the scent, the customer's got to go up to another page to read about all the different scents and then come back. It, it's all contained. So I think that's the thing with user experience, right, is really thinking about, and I think merchants and, and sometimes agencies are so kind of uh, ingrained in, in, the, in the process that they've designed it. Of course, they know what the next step is going to be, but they're not necessarily considering what it looks like someone coming to this as a brand new person or someone who's coming to this that isn't. 25 and has been having subscriptions for, for five years or whatever 
so there's a lot to consider there but ultimately it's, it's really getting into the head of your your customer right uh, and that can be quite easy to do. you can just go out to people and say hey we've, we've got this it could be a paper prototype can you tell us you know how you would move through this and, and actually watching how people uh, interact with your site uh, or your prototype rather than just assuming that it's that it's all clear um so retention strategies i mean this is this comes up a lot but people and brands are still really hyper focused on acquisition acquisition is becoming significantly more expensive um you know with, with reduction in the ability to uh track people and their behaviors and the increase in cost per acquisition on platforms like facebook and instagram um and google you know cost per acquisition on google has, has been uh, a little bit higher for for many years so retention is becoming much much more important um ryan in terms of retention strategies and uh, we've talked a little bit about this in, in terms of flexibility but you know how do, how do you keep customers on you've got them on the subscription they've gone through a great user experience that they're signed up um what do what does a good retention strategy look like or what are some good tactics that you've seen implemented yeah um i think retention is, is really a case um first is like kind of prevention over cure so making sure that you have a great product offering you know make sure that your your brand offering and your your values etc are, are, are actually really enticing and that will be one of the biggest influences over retention anyway so mm -hmm. for, starting from the, the basics but when we do go from to like a product specific <laughs> element there are some strategies that uh, are available kind of a standard on really charged as we've as we've realized over the years that retention is a really key part and you mentioned there already that as the cost of acquisition is going up with uh, with third party data and cookies we really on you know it's becoming more and more expensive to acquire new customers um and actually to really measure the value of of, of acquiring customers as well is becoming harder so the ability to increase clv ltv from existing customer base is a really key piece retention is a kind of a foundation of that in, for example, the post-sale area, so you, you've got a, so someone subscribed to your, your products already, great. Now, how do we retain them? Firstly, making sure that we have good communications, they have that flexibility we mentioned with SMS and email options there, and, and the content potentially in the customer portal to keep them engaged and keep them aware of upcoming product launches, or make them aware of um, you know the, the ability to, to manage their subscription via promptive SMS and email. Um, also now uh, with, just in the customer portal, if they get into the point where, okay, I, I, I need to make a decision around whether I want to keep this product. I have a backlog, I have a, uh, I have a, a holiday to make, et cetera, et cetera. We built in retention kind of strategies or workflows directly in the customer portal, which is a great way to try and um, uh, reduce uh, the, the churn as much as possible. So we have this prompted service where if you go to cancel subscription, you can choose a list of different uh, reasons why a customer might can't cancel out and you mm -hmm. can actually give a prompt to for an action. So an example would be, I have too much product. Uh, and instead of them just canceling out, because that might just be a genuine reason that they're looking for, I just want to be able to, I just don't need a month, a, a delivery this month. Mm -hmm. You can just say, I'll say, I've got too much product and the prompt directly in that portal on a, on a pop-up mode will say, skip this month's delivery. Yeah. Or they say, I find this product is a little bit too expensive. And if they're a loyal customer, if they've already bought, you know, six products, 12 products from you, you might want to say, well, how about you take a, a, a bigger discount this month to incentivize them and give them a, a bit of a reward? Um, and it might be, uh, you know, 50% might be a, a free product this month. Um, mm -hmm. And you can kind of customize those directly in the portal. There's also things you can do to, to automate this as much as possible. That, that's quite reactive, but being proactive around, we've mentioned loyalty programs is a great way to retain, retain customers and make sure you've got that engagement there. Um, also, there's the ability to kind of build in with a, you'd probably need a, an agency partner at this point to start looking at how you can build in like workflows, for example, where it might be after at periodic points in the subscription, you're going to offer an extra incentive. So it might be, we're going to chuck you a free sample on month six. We're going to throw you a, a free toy, you know, you know, a free, a, a free uh, pet toy, whatever it may be at, at, at different intervals throughout the, throughout the subscription um, journey, just to keep those incentives. So prevention over cure, but if we do get to the point where customers are cancelling out, then those inbuilt retention strategies are going to be key. You mentioned, you know, potentially needing an agency partner, but I, I mean, Harry, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but who would you say just off the top of your head, uh, uh, you know, the best, the best Shopify agency out there? Is there maybe, any, anyone, anyone maybe Psycho, mind? who knows? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very, very, uh, very balanced partnership manager answer there. 
Uh, he said behind the scenes that he's psycho with the best, so I just not to upset any other agencies. I'm um, just aware of time, guys, so I'm going to skip on to the next one. Uh, we love an acronym in marketing, so bump up AOV. Uh, I'm hoping that means average order value. Um, very, very quickly. I mean, Harry, this might be a good a good one for you, just in terms of increasing average order value and, and the types of comms that go around that. Have you got any thoughts on on kind of um, tactics that you can put in place to to increase average order values on on subscriptions? Yeah, definitely. It's a space that we're really, really interested in at the moment, and it's. So that moment when someone's managing a subscription, we do that through our no login portal, which we call the magic cart. And within that, um, they have the opportunity to skip, pause, delay, all of those things. But we can also pull in a dynamic new product offering. So that can be a one-time purchase that's added to the subscription. And mm -hmm. then we're also going to be building in bundling functionality. So you can actually be expanding that subscription as well. Um, and so that can be through just kind of automated recommendations of product from the inventory that we believe that they would be interested in just based mm -hmm. on our analysis um, or we actually have the possibility to just pin particular products so your subscribers typically as a brand are going to be your most diehard fans they're your most engaged and they're the most valuable to you so if we see it where brands might be looking at a new flavor that they're piloting for example mm -hmm. or a new sample that they want to put out so they'll just pin that as the recommended product and it just means people can just bundle those into the subscriptions and receive them to to give some feedback off the back of that as well okay awesome uh, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm just very wary of time, and I do want to. There's a couple of questions that have come in that have answered, so I'm going to skip on to the next one. I'm sure everyone's got stuff that they'd like to say on this. We will share this presentation uh, out with everyone who attended today, so uh, you can read through in a little bit more detail. Uh, stepping into international markets, I mean, internationalization is is something that, that we're seeing a lot of it. Uh, Eastside Co. Joseph is an area that um, a lot of our merchants uh, come to us uh, for. Um, it seems like a, a really logical step if you want to, you know, if you're doing fairly well in one market to test the new market. Um, how do you go about deciding what what the next market to jump into is uh, and, and where you should be expanding to? That's to you, me. that is Jason, yeah. Oh, okay, all right. Um, yeah, obviously, we're seeing the seeing the relevance of this especially for anybody that's on shopify with shopify doubling down on markets internationalization uh the release this week of its kind of translation um kind of functionality so you know it, it's of a huge importance to a lot of merchants once they've kind of scaled in in one region uh looking at you know how they replicate that to other markets um data is probably the biggest biggest thing to kind of lean on mm -hmm. um when it comes to selecting regions to, to expand into, um, you know, language is probably another, um, you know, can you operate in North America, Canada, um, the UK, Australia, it's all going to come down to distribution as well. Mm -hmm. You know, how effectively can you distribute within those regions? Uh, unfortunately, kind of cross border trading, you know, comes with its nuances when it comes to taxes, when it comes to distribution, when it comes to shipping, when it comes to lots of back office management. You know, do you go and incorporate a company in the States under an LLC and then have, you know, an, a separate warehouse? So there's lots of different factors that you'd, you, you have to kind of, you know, it's a multi variable kind of scenario. Um, but the good news is that technology out there at the moment, enables you to do that very very easily either with shopify on shopify markets with recharge um or by spinning out another clone store translating it kind of immersively to that region you know we see customers that have different product ranges as well for different regions you know some products will do better in one area and other products will do you know do, do really well in another so we'll see kind of weighting of products or individual complete ranges for different regions um but ultimately, I think the first thing to start with would be either look at the data where your customers are coming from, mm -hmm. where the traffic is coming from, look at where it's easy for you to kind of pivot into and test um, without huge amounts of you know infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and do some run some focus groups, you know, see what people would make of your products in that region. Yeah. Um, do some testing, listen to some people that uh, you know, that would be your kind of key customers in in those regions before kind of going all in. Um, but like I said, the beauty of the technology at the moment means you can pilot things very, very easily um, before, um, you know, throwing everything in, uh, setting up company formation structures and, and kind of massively immersifying your website to a different language. Great. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on to um we've got a couple of questions that come in. Uh Ryan, you are gonna be put on the spot immediately okay, with great. this first one. Um so it's a question from Mike. He said, uh, we talked about the importance of allowing customers to pause the subscription. These are Mike's words, not mine, but this is not uh straightforward with recharge. Why not? Maybe it is straightforward and he just needs a little bit of guidance from you. But, um... uh, yeah, I, again, I mean, there's so many variables there. It depends on what uh, it is that you're looking to offer. It. If um, we try to make it as flexible as possible in the customer portal. So mm -hmm. uh, if, the, if the option to skip this month's delivery, to swap out products, to be able to change the frequency, if I, if I want to go from 30 days to 45 days, just to actually select a different um, collection, uh, charge date, should I say, Mm -hmm. um, and the ability to cancel out on the subscription, we try to make sure that that gives you all the options that you need and to keep the customer um, still purchasing. So to keep them on that recurring revenue element. If there really is a need to pause, it's there is a little bit of complexity to that because how long do you allow them to pause for? Mm -hmm. and when do you actually bring them back into the program? So it's the, the, it is possible to do that. It's a slight bit of customization needed. But mm -hmm. from a merchant's perspective, um, we want to make sure we're doing everything we can to to have customers active on their subscription. Um, a pause can become redundant quite quickly, and you could just have this pause state for some time. Mm -hmm. It's all better to allow them to cancel out and go through a win back flow if needs be, rather than just a this dom you know this dormant phase of, of, of pausing. Yeah. So yeah, that that's our, our kind of process there, and that's our thoughts behind it. There is, but by all means, you are able to to create a pause button in the portal. It's not out of the box for those reasons I just mentioned. Yeah, there's a there's slightly more complexity around the outside of it in terms of the logic of how the pause works. There is. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I think, Mike, to add to that, I think one of the most important things, because there's, there's lots of technology and functionality and stuff out there that, that agencies and merchants are very guilty of utilizing new technology for the sake of it being there. I think often a lot of these problems can be solved just with the um, the wording and, and the content that you have on those customer portals and around those buttons. So, you know, like you say, if you if you can kind of frame skipping correctly, which is you know out of the box functionality, you can almost make that feel like a pause to a customer. So it just comes around how how we can frame those frame those things. Um, and then, of course, the other option is to, um, if, if they truly want to pause, like if they want to pause for six months or something, that you can allow them to cancel out. And then um, I'm, I'm sure Harry would be able to add some kind of win back, uh, win back tactics to that. Um, Harry, I mean, is that is that kind of route that you you would think about going down? Yeah, definitely. I think so. There's, um, I mean. If you have the budget, pulling in a specialist Clavio agency to go about uh, winbacks via SMS and, and Clavio, definitely a, a super, super high impact way you can win some of that back. And Harry, if you were to name a, an agency that, that did Clavio <laughs> really well, <laughs> spoiler alert, uh, I just, I just. Um, thanks for the question, Mike. Appreciate that. Uh, hopefully, that's answered that for you. Um, uh, again, there's, there's there's lots of help out there for. Uh, if, if you do want support in creating some kind of custom functionality. Um, uh, Wilfred has said, you, manage, you mentioned SMS as a way to manage subscriptions. Uh, how about managing via WhatsApp? Is, is anyone working on that integration? Is, is, is WhatsApp something that's in consideration? Um, Harry, I suppose this kind of goes over to you really. Is, is, there, is that kind of on the roadmap for you guys? Is there, is there a consideration for it? And if not, you know, why is it not, in the, why is it not on your mind? Yeah, it's a question I get quite regularly. I've been in the messaging app space in e-commerce for the last like three or four years. And yeah, I've heard it regularly. But um, WhatsApp has is obviously owned by Meta. So it's under all sorts of regulations by its parent company. Mm -hmm. uh, that means typically um, there are all sorts of restrictions, which has just made it not particularly viable to build these kind of solutions for. Um, also, the same can be said for Apple iMessage. They opened up a very, very small um, API some time ago, but we also haven't seen any expansion there. The beauty of SMS is it is there is no parent company. It's not owned by any anybody really. So in terms of regulation, it's relatively minimal. And that is why the attention rates are all, are all so high there because it's a messaging app versus mm -hmm. email, which has been has had some time to mature as a channel. Um, but I mean 
yeah, I, I would strongly suggest looking at SMS. Um, I know that in the UK, for example, it's not quite as regularly used as in the US. And I think that's why in the US there's been such fast adoption and the amount of SMS marketing happening over there is, is huge. But it's, um, yeah, it is coming to the UK. Um, but there's a, there's a lot on the table for, for first movers there, I think. Yeah, um, so I think I think Wilfred's yeah. kind of given some context here and said he's in Asia and WhatsApp is highly used here instead of SMS. And and honestly, Wilfred, yeah. I think I think the same is true uh, around around the world. I think SMS is obviously still accessible even if even if it's not highly used. If you send someone a message outside of WhatsApp, that is going to pop up on their phone in some format, and they are likely to open it. The, the open rates on SMS are, are huge. Um, I also think it's worth thinking about what people use different messaging apps for. Um, so email people are very willing to give up their data now. And that's one of the challenges you have with SMS, certainly in the UK. Um, although the results that we've had from SMS campaigns has been very, very good. Um, you know, is WhatsApp an area where they're going to want to receive branded messages or would they rather keep that to, you know, their friend groups there, you know, the various things that using WhatsApp for, you know, if they're using SMS less, I think they're almost more likely to want to receive branded messages through that channel because they don't feel as protective over it. So that's, a, that's another thing to consider. Um, but thanks for the question. Um, uh, final question before we kind of head off, we're slightly over here, um, but is there a way to track inventory for subscription box type businesses? Um, I think the answer to that is just yes, uh, certainly in, in Shopify. Um, Ryan, is, 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 the, is there yeah. any kind of uh, context you can put around that? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, if it's a subscription box, for example, we we touched on like bundling, for example, Reach Out has this a bundle solution uh, recently launched, actually, which allows you to kind of offer a customizable box on the storefront. So you can build a box on the storefront and then the, the end user can manage that, uh, manage that subscription or that bundle of products individually uh, and as well as a box uh, in the customer portal. And that is all um, synced directly with the Shopify store. They act as individual products. So even if it is a bundle, it is like buying an, an in six individual products, for example, mm -hmm. although we, we have a, a wrap it up in a kind of bundle ID that allows you to, to treat it as, as a box of products. But yeah, there is, there's, it's directly correlated to the, to the, subscript, to the Shopify store. So every mm -hmm. product that's purchased, whether it's subscription or one time, um, essentially acts like any other order. And it's, I guess the, He's asked about subscription box. I'm assuming this is a, I don't know, we're going over here. So maybe, Carl, we could follow up separately on this, but I'm assuming it's a curated box of products where you've got a preset bundle where you've got three or four products and you're just offering it as a one skew product, but actually there's three or four products separately in that, which there might be a little bit of complexity there, but um, more than happy to follow up separately to that. Sure. I think uh, I think if, you're, if your inventory and your, your kind of product tracking is getting more and more complex, it may be worth considering a, uh, an ERP or, or something similar that, that helps you kind of manage your inventory and your SKUs and you can then connect that with Shopify. Listen, I, I appreciate all the questions. I very much appreciate um, your time, Harry, Ryan, Jason. Uh, hopefully you've all got a lot out of this. We will share the presentation and also the recording of this webinar uh, after the fact. Thank you all so much for attending. Uh, we look forward to seeing you for the next one and uh, speak to you all again soon. Cheers, thanks, thanks everybody. Goodbye. Thanks, guys. Yeah, guys. Bye-bye.